I was recovering from a shoulder injury. So I was a professional rugby player before, so I had a shoulder injury. Uh, and I had an operation in January, waiting for the next season to start. And it got to like April, um, so I wasn't playing at the weekend because I was injured. So I went home and um, the first hot day of the year, uh, went round to a family friend's house because uh, they had a swimming pool. I'd never been there before, but it, had like a, it was a feature pool with a waterfall in one end. And after lunch, I just took my T-shirt off, wasn't really concentrating, dived in where the waterfall hit the water so you couldn't see the bottom of the pool assuming it was deep, because this waterfall had come off this big rock face, um, but turned out what I thought was seven or eight feet was only about three feet. So hit my head on the bottom of the pool very hard. Um, and yeah, I dislocated the bottom of my neck, C6, C7 vertebrae, disc exploded, um, and rendered me immediately like completely paralyzed from the shoulders down. So fortunately, um, my dad and my friend were there, so they pulled me to the surface so I didn't drown. Um, and then, yeah, 45 minutes later, ambulance came. I actually ended up getting resuscitated in the, in the ambulance three times. Um, so, yeah, very fortunate to be here at all, really. Um, and then had a seven-hour operation uh, and woke up in intensive, intensive care, can, yeah, paralysed from the shoulders down. Being so close to Southmead Hospital, one of the leading neurological centres in the UK, Mr. Neil Barua, who'd just come back from two weeks in the Maldives, so he was on call on a Saturday night. He was one of their leading neurosurgeons. The coin started landing in my favour from quite an early, early stage. It's not until you look back um, how fortunate there were these different moments that resulted in me even having a fighting chance because my injury was very serious. Like a bit of the disc had lodged into the spinal cord. Um, and actually, it was seven days. It had been seven days after the accident when I'd, and I'd still seen like no recovery. Um, or I was told then that I had a complete injury, which fortunately didn't end up being the case. But um, if those things hadn't happened, if my dad hadn't floated me in the pool, if the paramedics hasn't resuscitated me in the ambulance, if Neil Brewer wasn't on call and I wasn't so close to Southmead, you know, I wouldn't be sat here today, or I wouldn't have walked in here today for sure. I can remember the moment way coming round and waking up and thinking, like, I don't know why I'm here, you know, and, and just being confused because you've been a general anaesthetic. And I'd woken up from general anaesthetic a few times because I had a lot of injuries playing rugby. Um, but then it dawned on me what had happened. Um, and it actually took me quite a long time to pluck up the courage to try and move something because I was like, please let me, please tell me this is a nightmare. You know, like you hear about this happening to other people. You never actually think it will happen to you. But then I tried to move my feet, my hands, and there was just, there was nothing. So I can remember that. I remember lots of friends and family coming in every day and acting as amazing distractions to me. I remember seeing the look in people's faces, you know, and reading that. And I'm on the inside looking out, but I've got tubes everywhere. There's big machines. It's an intensive care unit. And actually, my mum, um, she told me this since, or people have told me this since, she actually went into the waiting room and stopped people coming in until they'd seen photos of me so that they could do their sort of getting their emotions out before they, before they come in. And um, when they come and see me, they can just treat me normally, which was really important. So during the day, I had some amazing distractions. It was actually quite, in a weird way, it was great because I got to see everyone I know and love. They were flying in from all over Europe to come and say hello. It was like experiencing your own funeral. But also then at night when everyone leaves again and you're left with your thoughts and like, what does this mean for the rest of my life? Like, who am I now? You know, what, my, my career, my, my relationship, how am I going to be able to afford physio? Like all of these sorts of things um, really do play on your mind, yeah. There was times where I had those thoughts of like, this would probably be a lot easier for everyone. You know, not just for me, for everyone if, if I wasn't here anymore. You know, fortunately I couldn't move enough to do anything about it. But um, it, it, I've, I've, never con I've never had thoughts like that before in my life. And I think it's, it's terrifying when you genuinely consider that that might be the best option. And I, I, I know people who've suffer, who suffer with depression and suicidal thoughts and um, I now have an appreciation for it. I know that I'm very fortunate that I don't live with it on a day-to-day -day basis, but a lot of the people we help through the charity um, do. Um, and it's a scary place to be, so yeah. Because so I had my eyes closed and I was moving my toes and it feels like they're moving anyway, but you open your eyes and nothing's happening. But this one time I opened my eyes and it was moving. And I just remember shouting for my mum to come in. I was like, my toe's moving, my toe's moving. I thought it might have been a spasm to start with, but it wasn't. And then of course, I didn't want to stop moving it. 
But what it meant was there was still a connection past the level of my injury. So the surgeon had told me I had a complete injury, which means like a complete cross section of the spinal cord is now not transmitting signals or has died. So you have no scope for recovery, no matter how hard you try or train or push, um, you're waiting for a medical breakthrough effectively. Um, and I thought that was the case. And he was right to tell me that because that's what my you know, results were showing. That was my prognosis. But this meant that that wasn't the case. It was incomplete. There were still messages getting through. So by no means did we think we were out of the woods. And I, I never have imagined I got back to even walking, never mind you know, doing what I do in the mountains. But it meant there was a chance and there was a reason to keep fighting. So it just became a let, let's see how far we can take this sort of thing. And that's what we did. Well, I stood for the first time in the spinal unit. So after about four months, so I stood and took my first steps, but that was in parallel bars with someone else moving my legs. And um, nine months, I was starting to stop using the wheelchair. So like I was sort of transitioning out of the wheelchair, just using sticks and foot splints. And then 12 months, I climbed Snowdon. And there were 70 people there on the start line. Uh, people I didn't know, you know, who come for their own reasons and sharing their own stories. So I was like, oh God, I'm gonna actually have to get to the top now. Um, and it took nine hours and it was very, very painful, very difficult, but it meant so much to me. Like it was the first time I'd really, um, felt of use again or actually seen something positive coming out of this negative situation because up until that point I had felt useless and I felt like a burden and I felt like a complete loss of purpose and of course I wasn't that's how I felt compared to Ed the professional rugby player who did things for other people you know is there's that I would have found I know now wherever my level of progression had stopped I could have found a life of, life of purpose and po lived a positive life because I know people with all levels of disability who are living amazing lives. But at the time, you don't feel like that because of that comparison, really. I was saying you should leave me, you know, like because she didn't sign up for this. And she stood by me like a rock the whole time, which was amazing. And she became the person to really focus my energy towards getting better for. And that I found that a bigger driver than just thinking about myself. Um, and walking down the aisle to be able to actually cancel the wedding and then stand in hospital and then speak to the venue and ask to rebook for another time. So they were giving it away, but actually they said they'd been watching and hoping and save the date for us. So we actually ended up getting married on the same day that we had planned. Um, and then that motivation to walk down the aisle was, was a strong one. Um, so it was a really, really special occasion, obviously. That feeling on top of Snowden of some good coming for other people from your terrible situation was an addictive one. And it got to the point where, you know, if enough good can come from this situation, then for other people, then by definition, you get to a point where it comes from a bad thing that happened to a good thing that happened. And that became, that manifested itself in mentoring other people, the same way I'd been mentored, and then starting the charity. And now to see what the, you know, what the charity's become and becoming and the people it's helped and the amazing job Lois has done running it on a day-to-day -day basis is something that I'm really proud of, but it's still something that really helps me because I can genuinely look at my accident and go, that was a good thing that happened because look what it's doing for other people.